can you help me do that? I need this done by you know this time or um, and a lot of the times uh, a set date is not a good way to do it, but maybe a an event that's coming up. So we're having an open house in a couple of weeks. Can we get this project done by then? Um, you know, what do you need me to help you with? What what type of you know uh, resources do you need? Do you need you know someone else? Whatever it is, just you kind of need somebody to take charge and and ask those questions. Well, I think we were talking about this earlier on, like. The overall driving force of the hackerspace is it, for us and for the ones I'm involved with anyway is that it's like something fun, you know, like we want to have So um, if it doesn't matter how good an idea is, if it's not good enough that, that somebody in there wants to sort of be the driving force on it, like if you're, if you're like assigning people to do things, like that's not necessarily fun, um, you know? Unless you call them ninjas. <laughs> Yeah, no, if you seriously. come up with a cool name for them, that's okay. I, we, we, and recently, one of our members has taken on the role of the sign ninja. And as soon as we started calling him the signage ninja, like all sorts of cool things started showing up on our walls. I am not kidding. It's the greatest thing ever. It's, uh, yeah, call people ninjas. Yeah, and, and I, I, I've said this earlier, but you know, at Noisebridge, it, it's anarchy, and it really works for us. So if someone's really passionate about something and they want to do it, they just go ahead and start. They can get other people involved by talking on the email list, on IRC, in person, um, recruiting any way they can. If other people are interested, it takes off. Like our near, uh, near space balloons, there's two groups at Noisebridge that uh, started just because one person said, wow, look at this, this is really cool. And now there's two groups sending uh, balloons up into space and taking snapshots of the planet. And you know these are things that take off. And um, some other things that were really cool, kind of like uh, uh, at, at Crashbase, you know, they're cool ideas, but there was never any uh, enough people to make it coalesce. And you just have to let go of those, and make, that makes room for whatever's next. Uh, re real pretty, quick, pretty sure you may have been referencing our list of 150 ideas that we have on the project page. And um, we, we were talking about giving things priority. Like, this is going to be an idea that's going to happen, and this is going to be something that we're not going to even do. So I think that is an also, also an important factor of making things happen. Oh, and um, well, one thing that we, all, we also do is every, every single meeting, we have something to do. Cause we, right now, since we're um, uh, trying to get the space, we, we meet biweekly. And every meeting, there will always be a set scheduled event that's promoted for two weeks, and that will um, and that generates a, a lot of interest, and it grows the space because pe people will um, you know they'll they'll send the invites out that they're getting on the social networks to all their friends, and um, it it really it, it grows things very quickly. Oh, one thing that worked out for us well uh, last year, we had our third birthday, and we found out people like an excuse to make cool things, so uh, make an if you have a reason to make an exhibition or something, offer them places for the projects and a deadline. And uh, suddenly, there might be five more projects happening before the, before the deadline. That didn't exist before. So that's cool. And another thing, anything space related, uh, ban the phrase, someone should. <laughs> and replace it by I will, and things, at least discussions about projects will become bearable. Um, we've had this for a while, and. Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't agree with that more. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, like telling people like that, or, or just like someone should do this is like the worst possible thing that can happen. All right, cool. Thank you, those, those were, actually, I thought that was a really great question and answer session. The, Every, how many else thought that was a good one? Thank you. And we're going to the back this time. Yeah, uh, hey. This, uh, this question is for OpenFly. Um, OpenFly, uh, your hackerspace only attracts gay men. And um, I, yes. wanted to, I wanted to open a hackerspace for fat goth chicks. What do you suggest? <laughs> well. Okay, this is a tough one. As a gay man who's totally into fat goth chicks, 
my suggestion is the first thing you're going to want to do is turn out the lights, throw on some like KMFDM or something, or maybe just straight to pesh mode. Um, you're going to need a lot of drugs. Uh, a really bad DJ. He's going to need, need to be well over his prime, maybe a little creepy looking. <laughs> I will not condone making fun of other members of the panel while I'm up here. <laughs> Maybe later in private. Um, however, I would like to point out the young lady who asked that question will be presenting at DEF CON, and she has a pretty good talk, and you should definitely go. <laughs> Next, hopefully, serious question. Hi, I was wondering if anyone on the panel, the organizations that you represent, if, if any of you identify yourself as something other than a hackerspace. Um, recently at my hackerspace in Chicago, we've had discussions about using other terms like makerspace, community workshop, mainly around the challenge of discussions with, with possible sponsorships and the, the term hackerspace and, and how people initially react to that. Um, so was interested to see what the panel thinks about the term and if it's important and what it means and, and what you're using. Uh, Jim, did you want to take this one? <laughs> um, uh, I would. I, I don't remember what phrase we used, and I was actually trying to look that up quick on our website. Um, but we, we've used both. We had this. We had this issue early on when we were forming if we were going to be a makerspace or a hackerspace. We were thinking, let's be a makerspace because we want to appeal to everyone and sound good. And then I said, let's be a hackerspace because we want to do that too and break stuff. So, I, I think it's really important to own the word hackerspace. Actually, uh, well, I'll you know you know I'll say collaborative workspace. I'll say makerspace occasionally, but I, I think it's really important to keep using the phrase hackerspace and really be what you are, and then have that fill the word. Um, yeah, because it's actually yeah. Yeah. It's more widely used. It's a widely used term. Yeah. And it's actually a good thing that the term hacker gets some kind of like yeah. redefinition yeah. of what it is. Yeah. 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 We've we've kind of we've kind of taken the, the posture of using hacker as much as possible and when anybody responds with any kind of question or hesitation, we like blatantly make fun of them for like believing like Hollywood movies and stuff. We're like, you know, th this isn't this isn't like that crap, this is like actual hackers, you know, and then we sort of, like, it opens a chance for us to explain like what hackers do, um, which, you know, sort of makes things better for everybody. Yeah, we've had the, the, the idea of like, you say hackerspace and you look for that twitch, and if you see that twitch, <laughs> don't take a breath, just say it's a space where you build and make really cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's um, a community space. Yeah. And, you know, if we're spending uh, a lot of our energy or any of our energy worrying about what some mythical other might think of us, then we're doing a disservice to ourselves and the mythical other. So um, the, by owning the word hacker and hackerspace, Noisebridge has generated an incredible amount of very positive press in the mainstream. And uh, you just wrote an article that fits in with that as well uh, about hackerspaces. So, um, if we keep putting it out there, and there's so many examples of so many of us in this room doing positive things for ourselves and the people around us in the world, the uh, people take notice, and uh, Hacker is becoming more positive as a result. I also think that like the, some of those other terms uh, imply something else, you know, and might attract a different sort of person. You know, there's sort of a, what is it, tech shop where you can sort of become a member, and it doesn't, you know, you're not expected to interact with the community at all. You just go and you sort of use the tools and everything. And so I think like trying to like incorporate those terms to make things more, you know, like friendly media-wise, attracts people who aren't necessarily interested in a community. And I think that. A community is a, is a huge core part of a hacker space and, and attracts those sorts of people. So at NYC Resistor, we had an early member named uh, Dino, Dino Dizovi. He's a very talented security researcher. Um, he ended up leaving the group for different reasons, and uh, he's now, uh, he runs in a uh, NYSEC meeting on Tuesdays in the, uh, during the month. I forget which week of the month it is, but. Uh, Early on, we lost a lot of our good software, like specifically software talent, and uh, we became more focused in hardware. And I think that's kind of a negative side. Uh, that's a, kind of the problem with being a, ma a maker space, is you kind of chain yourself more to the maker culture, which has differentiated itself in the past from the hack culture. Uh, O'Reilly originally had a hack and a make uh, different blogs. Uh, the hacker space kind of is all inclusive in a way. 
I, I understand that it may have some derogatory terminology, but I think we're changing that. Uh, I like the idea of this omniculture that consumes all things and allows for the re reuse and reappropriation and this mix of cultures and reuse of technology in different ways by different people, regardless of soft or hard. Um, no. and actually, most projects I know uh, are sort of a, a hybrid of hardware and software and, and stuff like that anyway, so those, those boundaries are blurring. And craft and art and craft whatever. Craft and art, and you've yep. got to know a little bit about everything. Uh, we, uh, had, uh, you know, we had we um, had uh, a good uh, portion of um, of makers in our in our hacker space while we were at FIU because we had the infrastructure there to support. We had tables, we had soldering irons, we had all the facilities of the school. When we moved, they kind of they kind of stayed behind because there's there's just really no no room for that at at a pizza mansion. But regarding the regarding the um, the use of the word hackers uh, hacker and hacker space um, ha a lot of the research that hack Mammy does ve is very much in the realm of studying techniques of unauthorized access and and um, you know data interception and uh, malware and botnet type stuff um, but it's not it's not that we're doing it for for the for the bad side we're not you know we're, the, when people hear hackerspace, it's if by now they're associating with someone automatically selling credit card numbers or, or that type of stuff, then then they're stupid and we don't really even deal with them. Um, a lot of the a lot of who uh, a lot of the you know corporations and stuff who, who will talk to us, they they understand it's just mostly a vulnerability analyst penetration testers, and they're just going about it uh, on on the completely ethical way, and um, that the word hacker and club. And it has that as well. It's all just, it, it's more of a cultural thing instead of criminal. Cool. Uh, throwing it back to the back. Um, yeah, first off, I wanted to say uh, I heard about hackerspaces uh, about a week ago, and I had no idea. You guys have been very informative, and I like this uh, whole idea. Uh, second off, Nick, for you, uh, as I'm also a resident of DC, and I wanted to hear about Hack DC a little bit. Everyone else has said something, but I didn't catch anything from you. Um, but uh, before you go into that, if you mind, uh, the real question I really want to ask is what kind of connection do you guys have with your colleges? Because uh, I'm really interested in going to Stanford, and Crash Space uh, sounds like a very interesting thing I would like to find out about. Well, we're, we're, we're a little far away. Yeah, we're, we're in Los Angeles. Think about UCLA, the DMAS program. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a Cal Arts. There's a, uh, there are a lot of good uh, in Los Angeles, but I think it's, it's closer to Northbridge. Yeah, there's actually, uh, Sanford is in Silicon Valley. Uh, I usually call it Silly Valley because it's a silly place. But uh, uh, the next suburb over is Mountain View, and there's Hacker Dojo, which is a really cool hacker space uh, right there. Um, I guess just to answer that question, HackDC is still doing really great. They just moved into their larger space, fortunately, in the same building. Um, so that's cool. And the great thing about DC is that right about now, um, two new hacker spaces, one, um, DC is normally split in, I guess, three zones. There's Northern Virginia, there's Central DC, and then there's Montgomery, PG County in Maryland. Um, unallocated space, which is getting going, and I'm proud to be a uh, a member of this, this starting collective, which is going to build a hackerspace right between Hack DC and Baltimore Node in Baltimore, um, in Southern Maryland, the Maryland that borders DC, and also um, RevSpace, uh, Reverse Space, is opening up uh, near Dulles Airport in Virginia. So now is actually a really great time for spaces in DC, and I'm glad somebody brought that up that I could point that out. But um, thank you. Yep. Oh, you're welcome. Now, now that I'm finished tuning my own local horn, uh, we'll go back to the front for another question. I've actually strangely just been thinking about buying a bus, but um, it strikes me that driving around from community to community and, well, from place to place and trying to form a community overnight with, you know, a few hundred square feet of space to call your own would actually be a challenge that might be beyond me personally. But it had me thinking, um, those of you that mentioned specific sizes for your hacker spaces, kind of mostly mentioned numbers with the exception of Noisebridge between one and 2,000 square feet. And that's kind of the size that the original Noisebridge space was as well, that I have many pleasant memories from. And even though the giant Noisebridge space has been good for me and my projects, I must admit I feel a certain amount of nostalgia for the cramped pressure cooker that we had originally. Um, and I don't really know if I can extrapolate from that to thinking that there is some kind of community benefit, like everybody feels a little bit more on the spot for being perhaps more considerate of other people or other projects or things like that. 
But I was kind of wondering what you guys collectively thought about that, about um, whether you know, that growth, uh, what kind of effects you expect to have from growing to larger spaces, or what you've seen, or what you think might be the effects. Just one uh, comment concerning the Hackplus thing. It's actually not a comment. It's a call for help. Uh, because the thing is up there all the time. Uh, we started a mailing list, and I would like you to subscribe on the mailing list because we want to solve a problem. It would be really great to have something like a, uh, like a tracking system for hack buses, and we try to develop that. There are actually systems out there to do that, but we are just too stupid to do that. So APRS. You're, you're hackers out there, so maybe subscribe to our list, and maybe we can get it working. I don't know, but now back to the hackerspaces question. Um, okay, this is, uh, the, the, I'm kind of sad that the triple C guys left. Um, I, I think there's a, a fundamental point at which a hackerspace has to decide whether it's going to rise above being just the sum total of its community and allow its hackerspace to either become something more like the triple C did when they laid down their bylaws and said, we are the triple C and this thing that we've created is going to outlast us. That limits you in a way. Uh, it becomes more of a, a foundation for a very large organization. And as you said, that means you lose that community. Uh, it, it's more strict in guidelines that are designed to further the triple C for a very long time. And maybe that will happen in the United States. I, I kind of hope it doesn't because I agree with you. I like this, the community aspect. I like knowing the people being, I like that each one of us is a completely different group of people who are very much born of our geographic location or the people who just work together to build our, our community. I sort of like to picture the world as the Paleolithic era, and there's all these dinosaurs around. And you have the universities, they have a little tiny head, and they have a giant body. And to get their attention takes a lot, and to get them moving somewhere takes a lot, but they move, when they move, there's a whole huge thing. And I always pictured hackerspace is more like the little Uteraptors and the tiny, you know, they're small, they're agile, they may occasionally run off cliffs or get eaten by something larger. Um, yeah, and, and it, as, you know, as you look at evolution, things go from being small and they find a niche and then they grow in that niche. And I think that's actually what's happening right now in the hackerspace community is a lot of people have found that niche to fill and the thing is, who's gonna grow, you know, what new variants of this idea are gonna grow to fill that medium niche? Um, and I think that's kind of what we're finding out in the US right now. Um, it sounds like Germany's experiment and had a little longer history. Um, I personally feel that if we keep the tenor that's already existed in this, we are gonna keep the small agile spaces, we're gonna get more tiny spaces like in garages or in basements, and then we, I think you know, some communities will decide for our community it's right to grow. Um, but you know, I, we, we start out in 700 square foot and move to about 1,500, and it actually, there's moments where it's like, yeah, it was kind of fun to like, be able to like, do this and hit half the people in the hackerspace. Like, <laughs> I think for hackerspaces, it's possible to have like a specific sort of like groups collaborate and for example, within our heat sink labs, there's a specific group of people called the sink fleet who, um, who meet up on their own time at heat sink labs to work on the near space project. So there is still um, a way for people to meet up together and do their own projects. It's just uh, within what realm and how specific you get. Um, yes, I live in a not very large city where the only place to buy a power supply is Best Buy. And I currently work for a business that I have an opportunity to open a hackerspace if I wanted to. And I was wondering if it would be better to go for a not-for-profit to help you know, my community more and giving them an area to work in or if it would be better to do a for-profit place. And what's the problems you guys had going for not-for-profit or for-profit? Um, I think I'm de facto on the uh, we are a for-profit. Um, the benefits of the for-profit are simple. It's very easy. Um, in fact, if you're a 5013C and you don't finish your paperwork, you end up being a for-profit. So it, it, it is the fact de facto standard once you incorporate you are a for-profit until you finish your 5013C. Um, the taxes are a little bit easier to do, but you run into some weird incongruencies. Uh, Sadly, with the, with the not-for-profit, our founders uh, every year end up having to pay taxes on the LLC, and then we have to reimburse them after the fact, and it's kind of a, kind of a pain for them because they have to file all this extra paperwork, they have to pay, lay down this money, and they get paid back. Um, but we have other benefits where if like the Discovery Channel or some other group comes to us and says, hey, we'd like to do something with you, 
we can negotiate with them without any of the restrictions of being a 5013C. However, we also don't get free stuff from universities when they go, hey, we're throwing out our old, you know, furniture, would you like some? Um, each way you go, I mean, the 513C guys can speak to it, but uh, we've had some real benefits in terms of our partnerships and how we do things, you know? Yeah, so uh, NYC Resistor and Noisebridge were born out of uh, Chaos Camp 2007, the same place, the same time. Uh, NYC Resistor <clears throat> with uh, Breed uh, and the group uh, founding, including Matt, um, decided to go the easy route of getting LLC, and they were a hacker space within several weeks. Noisebridge, we kept meeting and talking about uh, what would be better for profit, nonprofit, and if we're nonprofit, what kind of nonprofit, and should we be membership, would it be board driven, and on and on and on and on. And we didn't get together to hack the law, we got together to hack the planet. So, um, but. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's an arduous process, but the thing is we, we ended up uh, collecting enough money uh, just from, you know, $5 here, $25 there to get $2,000 together to pay a lawyer who exists primarily to create nonprofits, 501c3 in the United States. And um, she did a great job, and it took uh, about a year, but we are now 501c3, and our entire process is uh, documented. Most of it is now on our website, uh, including all of the, um, the paperwork we had to do for the IRS, for the state of California. Most states are, have a lot of differences, but there's a lot of overlap. So no space, um, I'm hoping, we'll need to spend $2,000 to go through that process again, and maybe it can short circuit it to a few months rather than a year. Um, there are a lot of trade-offs for every decision you make. Uh, what we wanted to do at Noisebridge, and I would recommend this approach for everyone, is to create a legal structure uh, that as closely as possible reflects who you are as a group. It's not going to be exactly the same um, because the law is one thing and our day-to-day -day reality lives are another. Uh, but for us, uh, being the you know the hippie punk uh, anarchist etc. Uh, group that we are, being a nonprofit um, membership run organization suited us, uh, reflected us the best. So that's why we went that way. Um, you know, Bree, uh, I've known for a long time. He's very much expedient. Let's just get things done and hack. Yeah. And so the LLC was a really good approach uh, for them. Uh, NYC Resistor doesn't actually make a profit. It was just an expedient way to get a legal structure up and going. Well, that's not strictly too true. Uh, according to the IRS, we've made a profit every year, even when we moved and tried to drive our uh, costs so high that we wouldn't make a profit. But uh, I, what, in lines with what he's talking about, I think uh, you have to fundamentally identify what a hackerspace is. And I consider it a library for doing. And in that regard, you do have private and public libraries, and they serve different interests. But as it is, you're kind of set in this cookie cutter mold of 5013C or LLC or something to that effect, and there's nothing else. No, I would actually really encourage people to move to Vermont. Uh, <laughs> in some ways, I think, and I think hackerspaces are a wonderful opportunity to really sort of uh, push the boundary. So we started as an S corp. We're looking into becoming a 501C3, but there's a lot of stuff like in Vermont. There's a low profit. Uh, corporations, and there's a lot of, and in the social entrepreneurship world, there's a lot of really interesting legal paperwork going on in terms of trying to sort of redefine what's possible in a business structure. And I think, honestly, you know, as much as, uh, you know, a lot of people are allergic to MBAs in this community for good reason, um, there's some really interesting stuff, particularly in the social entrepreneurship community that are, are, that are going on, and I think we should try to push our state uh, governments into giving sort of more interesting corporate structures. And you know, you can just start it and file for a 501c3 later. Yeah, and I'll, uh, I forgot to mention, one of the advantages of being 501c3 is it uh, induces people, it gives people an incentive to donate. And when we got our space, we instantly needed uh, first months, last months, and deposit very quickly. Um, so within 24 hours, being a nonprofit, we got $12,000. Uh, that wouldn't have happened for us if we weren't nonprofit. 
And just to mention options, there's also a 501c11. You can form a cooperative in a lot of states if you're a cooperative of the members and there's not a, someone owning stock in you that, that's considered a state nonprofit, although it's not a 501c3. So I, there are some other legal vehicles out there. You know, it's the sort of thing where every state's a little different. Some states are awesome, some really suck. So I guess it, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but maybe if you can Google one, they might be able to help a little bit. On that note, uh, we personally hate doing our taxes. We have an accountant, and I highly recommend that hackerspaces, at least for their first couple years, do get an accountant, walk through with them, make sure that you don't screw up and end up with a situation where you owe a lot of money to the IRS. I mean, you're gonna run into situations where you end up owing money. It happened to even to the Seabase uh, guys over their power bill. So, you know, you gotta be careful. You wanna, you know, be really smart, build up a, a cash buffer, but you really wanna make sure that when you go through this stuff, you have a professional sit down with you, pay them money if you have to, and, you know, figure it out, do it right the first time. Um, I just wanted to say one more thing. I know that um, one of our members has kind of started up a mailing list, I believe, on hackerspaces.org for um, finances, just getting everyone who does finances and hackerspaces kind of together to talk about, you know, the problems that they're having and how they fix it and things like that. And, um, I, I was going to say the, the, the nightmare of um, the 501c3 paperwork, um, it's supposedly the IRS is saying that they're going to have it, uh, that you can do it on an online web application by the end of the year. We'll see how fast they move on that or if it's even good. But and normally it costs $300 to file a 501c3. They've bumped that up to $400 now. And then if you do it online, it's $300. So um, that's also something to think about. Maybe you might want to wait till they actually have it up and running to, and save yourself some money and do it online. Um, or since it's the government, who knows when they'll have it done. And uh, Noisebridge on the bottom of our front page is all of the information for 501c3 if you want to check that out and see if that's something that you and your space are into. All right, next question. So uh, I guess I grew up with the advent of hackerspaces, and uh, I was really lucky to have a shop in my basement when I was growing up, so I could just build stuff. But as soon as I you know, chose to go to college, all of a sudden the question was, is there going to be a place for me to play? Uh, originally thinking dorm room, I ended up being lucky enough to have something like miters. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but uh, as I understand, it's a pretty unique place in a university. There aren't too many uh, student-run machine shops that are also open to the public and something that I would call hackerspace in a university. Uh, I was wondering what you guys would think about trying to start up more of these kind of university hackerspaces that are completely uh, self-sufficient, they make money from some other thing. We get it from working at a, an electronics like Swap Fest Meet. Um, and like, I think it would be a really good idea to try and push this uh, in other universities. Um, so just before anyone answers, I would like to point out that's actually a really good idea for anyone in a royal air, rural area. Contact your local college, because a lot of you guys do have machine shops, and a lot of them may not mention it publicly, but they do actually have like, you go in, you do a quick training course, and they'll give you access at certain times during the day. It's like their libraries. You can pay a monthly uh, semester fee to use it, depending on the school. Yeah, make use of whatever local resources you have, universities, libraries, uh, you know, whatever robotics group, Linux user group, whatever's available, make use of it. You know, that's part of our community. Yeah, the caveat on that, of course, is that if you're doing that with a university or, or a business or something else, um, there's always somebody else who can sort of pull the rug out, you know, and, and it's sort of like out of your hand. So you have freedom for a while, but th there's someone else like kind of that controls the strings and that's something to be aware of. I went to a university with a computer science house and I absolutely loved it. It was great. And we actually made our extra money for playing and taking trips by running our own computer pod, which was, you know, like a campus computer pod, but it was kind of just in one of the dorms. We were open later, things like that and ran into exactly that. After a couple of years, the university said, well, this isn't making us money. We can turn that into four dorm rooms and we're just gonna shut you down. Um, so I would say definitely go for that, but also understand that, you know, it's one of those design pattern situations. Yeah. You know, it's, one of the patterns is stand on your own, yeah. and if you're not gonna do it, yeah. Yeah, we should really remind the people to check out the Hackerspace's design patterns, because they're pretty much out there, and Jens Olig, one of the guys who wrote them, pretty much says, no, do not do it, do not, like get yourself attached to a bigger institution that can dominate you in some form. So try to be independent. That's what he says, and it 
most of the time it actually is true. Yeah. And if you're going to do something different, just yeah. be aware that there's a good reason why it was, it's very common to do it one way, and if you're doing it another way, just be aware of that. Yeah, one of the reasons why we started our hackerspace is because at, um, a lot of us found that at our universities or wherever we were studying school at, um, uh, a lot of these universities have access to resources that we don't know about or like huge 3D printers that they bought from a lot of money from the university's money, but uh, unless you're taking a class or unless the advisor likes you, you don't get access to these privileges. So um, that's, that's, I mean, if the university uh, it supports you and lets you use everything that, or all the things that you want to do and pushes you forward with this idea of a hackerspace, and that's great. I think you should do it. But There is a hackerspace at a school. It's called Build. Yeah. And what I, you know about them? And I was talking to someone from there, and what I found fascinating about that is that I was, what is, the, what is your structure? I asked them, you charge member fees or whatever. They said, no, it's free, and you get a key, and you have 24-hour access. And I was like, are you serious? Oh, uh, yeah, so that's, that's a benefit of it. One thing to be aware of also is that universities are really paranoid about what goes over their network. Uh, so it's better for machine shops, but if you want to like uh, step over the networks, the IT departments tend to get really, really upset if you're sniffing packets and stuff like that. Yeah, and as soon as you want to buy, uh, want to build like sex machines and stuff like that, or, or like frame flame throwing robots, I mean, ooh, the university will yeah, tell you not fuck too off. happy when you have a box of hand grenades shipped to you. Um, Next question. <laughs> I, I, I was gonna mention some real fast. There's also uh, NASA has a hack space at one of their places. Yeah, they're working with the Titan One. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to put in a good word for the um, uh, hackerspace we built down in um, Raleigh, uh, Chapel Hill, Durham area, 20,000 square feet. We have a lot of people, uh, about 80% of the people that were at the local 2600 meetings for years are the core group in it. And uh, there was a disparaging remark made by the gentleman to Mitch's right about tech shop. So we solved all of our financial and um, liability issues by being, opening tech shop. But the founder is a, is a hacker of serious... Uh, intent and if, if we don't have a flame throwing or plasma shooting project you know going on he's like not happy so uh, we, we were, to we're absolutely turning it it is a hacker space that's the phrase we use and so you know tech shop doesn't have to be like handcuffs and, and this sort of stuff so we're it's a high-end hacker space we're experimenting we'll see if it works but like I said the people who set it up and I'm one of the original uh, people setting it up we're, we're all like they're the rules are all the reasonable rules and and we're ignoring you know everything else but that shouldn't be taken as a disparaging remark okay. I'm saying they're different things yeah you know? and, and, and from like a public perspective they at least at least we're in Los Angeles and, and in California where we're at like people who are interested in tech tech shops was different than people who are interested in hackerspace right I, but, a, a lot of us did go for the yeah. machines we went there for the machines but it's absolutely about the community I, I, I go there for the people and it's, and it, again, like I said, the overlap between the 2,600 meetings and the people that are there at Tech Shop almost, you know, daily or no, that's, weekly. That's absolutely fantastic. And it's, I mean, it is. It's a yeah. high-end, it's a high-end hacker space. Uh, we're not, we're not breaking even yet. It's, it's the for-profit model. But that is one way to solve all the liability yep. issues and everything all, all at once. You just get a boilerplate, you know, and, and then uh, Yeah, the we paperwork. actually had people who came to our first meeting who, who thought the idea of, coming to a meeting where they had to like talk to other people was, was a negative thing and, and didn't ever come back because they, they didn't want to talk to people. They just wanted like, you know, access to a laser cutter. Okay. No. Anyway, ours, is, ours uh, isn't like that at all. Well, let me, uh, just a side note, uh, Tech Shop, I'm a, I'm a lifetime member of Tech Shop. But so um, am I. <laughs> and um, uh, Jim Newton, who started Tech Shop, I think is a great guy. Uh, Tech Shop isn't a hackerspace, but there's a great deal of overlap between the two. And uh, at Noisebridge, we recently worked out uh, a reciprocal agreement where anyone who's a member of Tech Shop gets half price membership at Noisebridge. Anyone who's a member of Noisebridge gets half price membership at Tech Shop. And assuming this works out, and I, it, it will, it is, um, this will probably be expanded for all hacker spaces. Shop that we would do in a hacker space. So I'm saying <laughs> we don't have any constraints. Okay, and then I think uh, this. It's going to be the last question because I just got dinged on time. So, Alex, take it away. Hey, uh, real quick, what's up with the Hackerspace Olympics? <laughs>
Uh, Hackerspace Olympics is an idea that was pretty much um, created by people at Pumping Station One in Chicago. Uh, and <laughs> our other Pumping Station One people here? <clears throat> Yay. So, um, yeah, the idea is to have friendly competition to encourage creativity. And um, is it actually happening at the Detroit Maker Fair? Okay, so well, one of the things happening at the Detroit Maker Fair will be uh, a competition of people using these uh, uh, toys for adults, power wheels, power wheels uh, souping them up but using stock uh, body. Uh, so that'll be a really fun thing to see all these full-grown people bopping around in those at very high speeds, uh, unsafe at any speed for sure. Um, well, we've been bopping around ideas of um, having sort of a, a hackerspace triathlon competition where something like um, you, you have to create software which will perform some task, and when you do that, you get a clue of where to find a box that has a whole bunch of uh, locks that you have to pick, and you open up the boxes, locks, and then inside are some um, parts that you have to build. And when you build them, then you have to turn off the TV across the room or something like that. Um, yeah, so I don't know, but it, it really hasn't gelled into a specific date and time. Uh, but if anyone has ideas and wants to collaborate on that, let's do it. All right, guys, thank you very, very much. This is, I thought this was a great two-hour panel. Give a huge round of applause to our panelists. And thank, thank you so much. I think this, this has been another really great panel. Just two quick announcements. At 11 o'clock um, in the Video Temple, we have a concert going on in the mezzanine level, and your friends who aren't uh, coming to the conference can get into it for $10. Uh, they're selling wrist bracelets right now. And Jason Scott will be doing a pre-Get Lamp presentation um, over in Lovelace right after this. So thank, thank you guys again so much. Give yourselves a Give huge round of applause. For Nick Farr. Thank you.